Okay, so welcome to the, actually this is the second lecture, right? In the first lecture I gave you an overview of the syllabus and how we conduct the course and the history uh, that underlies modern continuum mechanics. Um, so as I summarize, the course is more or less uh, split into two parts. The first half, roughly, is sort of what one would see in a classical continuum mechanics course, like almost uh, as little fat as possible, just concentrating on the minimum basics that I can provide. And then the second half, every week, we will cover a special topic, starting with rigid body dynamics and then linear elasticity, uh, soft materials, finite elasticity, finite deformations, um, and then atomic to continuum scale transition, a little bit of fluid dynamics, etc. Okay, so now we are in the first half, and we begin with in the, the first half with mathematical preliminaries. Now, I will call it mathematical preliminaries, but um, it will not be entirely devoted to recalling what you already know. Uh, it will serve that purpose, of course. You will recall some operations and constructs that you are already familiar with. But we will also introduce a few additional new constructs, a few new concepts. I will establish the notation that we will use consistently throughout the course. Um, and so you should be learning definitely a few new things. Notably, um, we will talk about at some point the concept of a tensor that is quite important for continuum mechanics. Um, okay, so what I've done is uh, you have these uh, notes on mathematical preliminaries. Um, uh, I will more or less go over all the important parts of those notes. Uh, in the notes uh, that I have distributed, you have a little bit more detail that I've typed. Um, um, what I will do is I will immediately get to the essence, but I don't want to skip the first few pages uh, where I talk about a so-called axiomatic approach and a few other things. So now, my goal in the course is always to sort of make sure that you're connected uh, clearly to what you already know and build upon that, right? Uh, but at the same time, I want to be, when possible and when useful, as precise as possible. So eventually, what I'd like to say uh, in about five minutes is that we work with quantities that you are already familiar with, vectors. Vectors such as velocity or position vector in the three-dimensional world that we are accustomed to. And if I'd like to measure the magnitude of a vector or the distance between two points, I'd like to use operations that you are already familiar with. Now, in order to uh, formally state that, eventually what I would like to say is that I like to work in the three-dimensional Euclidean vector space. So for us, such a, let me say, precise um, indication of where we are working is perhaps overly precise. Um, uh, but, but, but let me tell you what I roughly mean by that and why we need to be a little bit precise about where we are doing our calculations, where we are developing our theory. So eventually, um, I'd like to talk about a vector space, vectors that you are familiar with. I'd like to be able to measure distance or magnitude between of, of things. So that's where the concept of, or the name Euclidean comes in. And I'd like to talk about the dimension of our space, which is obviously three for us. Uh, so I like to talk about that. To be able to make all of these things meaningful, one has to take a few steps back. And in those lecture notes, I talk in a, just in a few pages uh, about a number of things. Now, the, a, 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 one of the fundamental math courses on, for instance, real analysis starts with the concept of a field. A field is nothing but a bunch of quantities that satisfy certain properties, which are called axioms. Okay? There are a number of axioms, and these axioms serve eventually to um, identify what numbers are. We want to talk about numbers, 0, 1.5, minus 72, etc. 
uh, we could be talking about apples and oranges, and those things could satisfy certain axioms as well. But no, I'd like to talk about numbers, right? And in particular, eventually, I'd like to talk about real numbers. So in the first pages, you see a first page and a half, you see a set of um, axioms, sort of set of certain things that we usually take for granted that serve to identify what numbers are. And you put on top of that a few other axioms, notably axiom of inequality and continuity, with which these things together, 14 of them together, are sort of things that make sense to you when you read them. But really, mathematically, if you had no previous knowledge of, let me say, uh, uh, basic mathematics, together these 14 axioms tell you what real numbers are. Okay? So now I know what real numbers are. And together, those things define a certain field, in particular, the real numbers. Now, I have certain objects that now I can work with, the numbers. And now I'd like to go to something else. I'd like to go to vectors. And when you look at the definition of a vector, what, what a vector is, it goes hand in hand with numbers, okay, or quantities that belong to a field. So I'd like to next define a vector space. Why? Because I want to talk about the velocity vector, etc. Right? So what is a vector space? Now a vector space, of course, includes, and let me call that V includes the vectors that we already are familiar with, but in a mathematical sense, it's much more broader than that. For instance, if I say I am looking at the set of all polynomials with exponent less than or equal to n, n you choose, let's say 5, those things also constitute, could constitute, and do constitute a vector space. Okay? So a vector, when I say a vector, it's not necessarily the vector like things that have, right, we say a uh, magnitude and direction, that's not necessarily the only vector we could be talking about. It is one vector, but vectors are more general. Uh, so they could in particular be functions, okay? What we call functions from our uh, fundamental math courses in the university, right? And to define a vector space, you have to refer to some numbers. And in particular, I'd like to talk about vector spaces that are endowed somehow with, that are associated with real numbers. Okay, so that would give me a real, if you like, vector space. And that's what I would like to uh, work with. So now, eventually this is where I want to go, right? So now you have some vectors, and again, you, if you want, you can always fall back at this stage uh, to what you are familiar with. Let's say a velocity vector. You'd like to measure, for instance, uh, its magnitude. Okay? Or you have two points, you'd like to measure the distance between these two points. Okay? So now those are the things you would like to additionally be able to do with a vector space. So once you have a vector space, if you would like to measure, let's say, distances, etc., it turns out you don't have a single way of doing that. You have to endow the vector space with your own definition of, let's say, distance, etc. And this uh, process goes through a number of stages. The most fundamental stage, and again, in the lecture notes, you can find a little bit more information. For our purposes, this much overview is more than sufficient. The first one is a inner product. So inner product, if you like, what it does is um, it serves to identify how well two vectors conform to one another. Okay? So I'll give you an example with the examples um, the, the setting that we are familiar with, I have two vectors, I take their dot product. Okay? So if I take the dot product, if the angle is zero, the dot product is maximum. If the angle is pi over two, the dot product is zero, etc. So this dot product is an indication of how well these two vectors conform to one another. It's just, I'm, I'm uh, trying to give you an idea. So that is what an inner product does. Okay? And dot product eventually is an inner product. So now, well, that's one thing you could do. But another thing you'd like to do is, this is my vector. I'd like to know how I can measure its length, okay? for instance, with a traditional vector. That's what a, um, that's what a norm does. Sorry, let me clean this up. 
And a norm is not something you independently define. We're going to um, cover, well, I'm just going to give you uh, three examples in a row for these, for our Euclidean space. Once you have an inner product, it already tells you what your norm is. Okay? Um, now, once you have a norm, you can measure the length of something. But now what I'd like to do is the following. I have one point here and another point here. For every point, let's say I have an origin, I have a position vector here and there. I'd like to measure the distance between these two points. Okay? And that is the concept of a metric, to measure the distance between two objects that belong to our vector space. And it turns out a metric is not something you need to independently define. If you have a norm, then you do have a metric. So now, if I choose my field, if I define it to be the real numbers, and then I have a vector space with that, which I endow with the Euclidean inner product, okay? in the common sense, then I end up with the Euclidean vector space. I haven't yet talked about what a dimension is. That's something we're going to cover uh, soon. But if the dimension is three, then I talk about the three-dimensional vector space. And we simply denote it to be R3, okay? Not the most precise definition for a mathematician, but for us, at least now you know uh, what, a, what I mean by Euclidean, what I mean by a vector space, at least you have some idea. Okay, so from now on, in this course, we exclusively work with the three-dimensional vector space. That's where we live, okay? Um, so, uh, now, let me, let me tell you what the Euclidean inner product norm and the metric are in the notation that you are probably already accustomed to. So the Euclidean inner product, that's the first step, now, that's what you would often call the dot product. Okay. Is, let's say I have two vectors, and from now on, whenever I talk about a vector, uh, you can understand a vector that you are already accustomed to, like the position vector. And I will take another vector B. Notice that I always put a line underneath. That's the way I like to do it. Uh, there are other notations, but please stick to my notation in the course. And I indicate that I am taking their inner product or dot product essentially with a dot, A dot B. And that's equal to what? Let's say A has components, right? You know, A1, A2, A2 B, A3, B1, B2, B3. So what is A dot B? A1, B1, plus A1, B1, plus A2, B2. Do we all agree? Right. Okay. It's good that you agree because now I will show you why you have to be careful when you agree in a few minutes. Okay. But this would be our usual expectation. And eventually our expectation will be borrowed and translated into all of our calculations because it's such a convenient way to express this operation. But there is a caveat, something that we have to be careful about. I will make a note of it very shortly. So now once you have an inner product, then the norm is immediately, one says, induced by this um, inner product. And the norm is simply defined or indicated to be like this. So I'm looking at the magnitude, if you like, of the vector. That's another way to put it. And that is nothing but some i, a i squared, square root. Okay? Or in other words, if you compare with the upper line, I'm taking the dot product of the vector with itself and I'm taking a square root. That is the norm that um, the inner product induces because the inner product essentially appears within the norm itself. Okay? Um, right? So now eventually I'd like to have a sense of distance between two points that belong to the vector space, and hence we define also the Euclidean metric, um, which is simply nothing but this. So if you have two elements, A and B, that belong to, the, uh, to our vector space, then the metric is simply defined as the norm of A minus Okay. And the meaning of everything that I write is essentially embedded in these axioms and 
accompanying definitions. Okay? But you can from now on think that we are, as I said, in the usual um, setting of your, let's say, Math 101 or Math 102 course. Okay? But you have to be aware that the, we could have a non-Euclidean vector space, we could have uh, some strange vector space that is not necessarily composed of the vectors that we are accustomed to, and the norms and metrics do not have to look like this. So things can be much more general, but this is our uh, setting that we are um, using in this course. So now that we um, know where we live, and now that I remind you with concrete examples of these abstract concepts, let me immediately move on and be a little bit more precise. So in this part, I will go in more detail. Uh, again, you can follow from your lecture notes. Um, and let me talk about vectors, okay? Um, and the first thing to talk about will be basis sets. All right. Now, let us consider a simple sum. So at this stage, I'm just going to use a number n, the value of which I don't necessarily know. And I take a number of vectors, okay, v1, v2, v3, etc. And each one has also a certain coefficient, alpha 1. And these are numbers, of course. Um, 0.5 to whatever, I don't know what they are, okay? Um, now, I am assuming that each of the vector is non-zero, okay? And notice that I'm writing zero with the underline because I'm summing vectors, I better get a vector as a result of that. Zero would be a scalar number for me. So zero under bar means just a vector with all components being uh, zero, okay? So vi are not zero vectors, and this operation here, so in other words, taking a number of vectors, attaching a coefficient to them, and summing them up is called a linear combination of vectors. That's what I'm doing. Okay, so what I'm doing, essentially, I'm taking on the left-hand side a linear combination of non-zero vectors. That's what I have done. So the reason I've written this is so I'm considering this scenario where I'm doing that and the result is equal to zero, okay? So now that serves for me to identify or define what linear independence means. So vi are linearly, let me first write this, independent, If and only if alpha i equals zero for every i. And they are linearly dependent otherwise. Okay, very simple example, right? Let's say n is equal to two. I take two vectors, okay? Um, and you do have some idea of what linear independence is. This is just a way, another way to write it. So I have two vectors. This is one vector, and this is the blue vector. They are of equal magnitude and opposite direction. I take them and sum them up, vector one, times 1 plus vector 2 times 1. The sum is equal to 0, okay? So these vectors are obviously not linearly independent because you can actually describe one in terms of the other. One is just the minus of it. So that's what linear dependence means. They are linearly dependent. Whereas if I take these two, both are non-zero, right? And there is nothing you can do such that you multiply this by something and that by something, you sum them up, the result is equal to zero. It's not possible. The only way it is possible is if the coefficient themselves are equal to zero. And that's what this definition is precisely saying. If you want to talk about linear independence, you take a set of vectors, 
and they're equal to zero, if they are linearly independent, the only way that can happen is if the coefficients are equal to zero. If there is any other way, then they must be linearly dependent. Okay? That's a very precise definition. And it is useful because eventually I'd like to have, be able to work with and understand a set of vectors that I know to be linearly independent. Why? Because eventually I'd like to define what is called a basis. Okay? So um, let us go to the next step. Now, before I like to go to the basis, um, I'd like to talk about what a dimension is. And it's a concept that immediately emanates from the definition of linear independence. So I like to say my dimension is 3, 4, whatever. Okay. And the definition is quite compact and simple. And so one says that if a vector space, right, I've already introduced the notation. I'm calling it it's calligraphic V can accommodate at most n linearly independent vectors, then it has dimension n. And so then we would have R n. N could be anything you like. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if I'm in two dimensions, okay. If I do have a two-dimensional vector space, these are two vectors that are linearly independent. If I put a third one, I can express the red one in terms of the blue and the green. So obviously, if I, throw, I, I cannot throw in a third vector if that vector lies in the plane of these two vectors. So that space is for sure two-dimensional. But I can increase my dimension and do that. So now, that is a three-dimensional vector space. And if I put a fourth one, that fourth one can be expressed in terms of all the others. I cannot throw in a fourth one unless I increase the dimension of the space. Okay? So that's what practically this simple definition is doing. And it's immediately following from the definition of linear independence. So I have a vector space. It can accommodate at most n linearly independent vectors. The dimension is automatically n by definition. So next, I'd like to define what a basis is for this n-dimensional vector space. Essentially, the idea is that I'd like to be able to express any vector in terms of a set of basic vectors, reference vectors, that I can systematically make use of. Um, so it's a matter of convenience only. So any vector should be expressible in terms of a set of basic vectors that I like to work with. Okay? And eventually, those will be what we will call a basis set. So how do you choose a basis set? Okay. In fact, it's not so hard. You choose, suppose you're in an n-dimensional vector space, you choose any, and any should be underlined, okay, any choice of n linearly independent vectors constitutes a basis. Right? So my goal was to have a reference set of vectors which are used to express any other vector. Uh, I will choose an arbitrary vector, A. And so now I'd like to express that vector as in terms of the reference vectors. right? Now, I know that the dimension is n, so if I take n linearly independent vectors, that is the most that that, that that space can accommodate. So n plus first vector is, by definition, expressible in terms of the remaining linearly independent vectors. So this is not linearly independent from the basis vectors. So those basis vectors, let me call vi, 1, 2, 3, to n, okay? And I have to take a linear combination of them in general to express this. Let me express the coefficients to be alpha 
Okay? So that statement as well is following from the um, definition of linear independence and the dimension of the vector space. Dimension is n. These are already linearly independent, and hence n plus first, ve first vector is expressible in terms of the remaining ones. Okay? Now, the tricky part is that you can choose any set of linearly independent vectors. Okay? So in other words, if I'm in 2D, you can choose this to be V1 and V2, but this is another one, that's another one, that's another one. So the choice is not unique. There are many different choices. In fact, there are infinitely many choices, right? So I could have chosen another set, but what doesn't change is that no matter what you do, you can choose at most n because that's the dimension of the space. So let me call that other choice wj, and the coefficients, of course, will differ, right? The coefficients will change. Right? Why do the coefficients change? Because let's call green 1, red 2, and that vector has component only along green. Its coefficient is, let's say, 1. Right? But if I choose another basis set, it has coefficient 0 along green and only along red. So the coefficients depend on your choice of the basis set. In particular, let's say, for one choice of basis set, only one could be non-zero, all the others could be zero. Let's say in that scenario, red is my vector A that I'd like to express in terms of V1 and V2, but if I choose another basis set, both coefficients are non-zero, right? Okay, so all of these things eventually come into play at some point. All right, we're in good shape. Um, now let us go to the next step. I'd like to introduce the concept of perpendicularity of two vectors. And technically, one calls them orthogonal. So if I take two vectors, vi, we will call them orthogonal um, if their dot product is equal to 0 unless i is equal to j. Okay, so v1 dot v2 is 0, v1 dot v3 is equal to 0, but v1 dot v1 is a non-zero vector. In fact, better be non-zero, right? So unless I'm taking dot product the same vectors, it should be equal to 0, then they must be all perpendicular or, in this sense, orthogonal to one another. Okay? But the magnitude of the vector is not necessarily one, right? So additionally, let me introduce the concept of a unit or a normalized vector. So a vector is normalized if its norm is equal to one for every member of the basis set. Okay. okay. So now, if I have a set of basis vectors vi that are both orthogonal and normalized, then we call such a basis set orthonormal. And whenever I work with the orthonormal basis set, I'd like to introduce an explicit notation to indicate that it is orthonormal. So whenever I write, I write EI, I'm referring to, from now on, a basis set that is orthonormal. And VI does not necessarily has to be so. Okay? So this is my special notation for an orthonormal basis set. Again, it's not unique because my basis set, it could be orthonormal. This is orthogonal, two orthogonal vectors. They could both be of unit magnitude. Again, it's not unique. Non-uniqueness is always there. But it is at least orthonormal. And why do I need it? Just in a second, we will see why. Right? And all of these operations are the operations that you are already familiar with. If you want to take the dot product or measure the magnitude, you do it as you already know. So orthogonal plus normalized. OK, so. Um, I could take a vector, the same vector. I already said that i equals 1 to n. 
um, alpha i, v i would be one representation, or beta j, w j, et cetera. But now, I could refer to a choice of orthonormal basis set. And whenever I do that, another notation that I will consistently employ is that to indicate the coefficient that has to do with orthonormal basis set member EI, I will not just put some random, let's say, Greek numeral, but simply borrow the symbol from the vector itself, in this case, A, right? And I will put a subscript, okay? So whenever you see AI, you should understand that this is the, um, the, the, the coefficient that multiplies a orthonormal basis set member, and that is associated with the vector A, okay? So the notation is very um, precise. So if I were to write, for instance, similarly, if I had another vector B, for instance, I would write this, beta j, vj. That would be for a random uh, basis set. But if I were referring to a orthonormal one, I would write bi, ei. OK? Just to be precise about the notation. And notice that this i, by the way, is entirely arbitrary. I'm just summing over it. So it doesn't have to be i. I could have made it j. So long as I'm summing over it, it's really irrelevant what I choose as that index. OK. So now we will have a number of quantities that consistently uh, pop up or operations. And for those operations, it's useful to have quantities that compactly represent those operations as well as eventually their implications. And one such quantity is the Kronecker delta. Okay. So the Kronecker delta, it's indicated to be delta ij, okay. small delta ij. And it's defined to be 1 if i is equal to j and 0 otherwise. And you employ that if you like, or represent it with respect to your orthonormal basis set, right? So this is the definition, right? But it's equivalent, effectively, to this, right? Because this is an orthonormal basis set. Unless i is equal to j, it is orthogonal, first of all. Unless i is equal to j, it is equal to 0. And if i is equal to j, because it's normalized, it's equal to 1. So ei dot ej is delta ij, if you like. Okay? So I, I've given you two equivalent expressions for the Kronecker delta. All right. Any questions so far? No. All right. We're warming up, right? OK. But perhaps that's a quantity Kronecker delta that you had not seen before. But it's super, super useful for our purposes. Um, now, I'm going to go back to a remark that I made a few minutes ago. Um, and I'm going to take two vectors. And eventually, what I'd like to do is I'd like to calculate their inner product. And you already told me what you expect the result to be. But uh, let's revisit that. Um, so there are two ways to express these vectors. Okay? One, I can express them with respect to a non-orthonormal basis set, a general basis set. I'm not indicating i equals 1 to n. Let's make that implicit. There is a sum over the, no, over the dimension. Um, and alternatively, I could use a orthonormal basis set. And in that case, I would use ei, ai, right? Um, and for b as well, beta j, vj, I am choosing the same orthonormal basis, non-orthonormal basis set. Okay, and likewise, I will choose the same orthonormal basis set. I don't have to, but that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So let's make this J, B, J, E, J. All right. And my goal is to calculate A dot B. Okay. 
right. So previously, you've already told me that your expectation is that you take the components, okay, and you, the components would be alpha or beta or A or B, multiply them and sum them up. That would be A dot B, right? So let's do that. Let's see where that takes us or how we find that out, right? So I want to take A dot B. So I'm now going to carry out the operation based on everything that I have defined, okay? Um, so A dot B is A I E I dotted with sum over J, B J, E J, right? And the sum sign is just something that I can move outside, right? Um, so sum over I, sum over J, A, I, B, J, E, I, dot, E, J. Um, now, this is delta I, J, the Kronecker delta. And I'm summing over both I and J. Unless i is equal to j, this, these, the relevant terms, the corresponding terms, are going to vanish. For instance, a1, b3 will vanish because delta 1, 3, 0. The only thing that will be left are those terms with equal indices, a1, b1, a2, b2, etc. So then I have only one index remaining. I can call it anything. I can call it k if I like. It doesn't matter. It's just to indicate that I'm summing over similar indices. I could have called it i as well, or j for that matter. And that is our expectation. Now, that's no surprise, right? Uh, why are we doing all of this? The point is to be careful about what we're doing and the assumptions that underlie it. That's all about the whole process of going over these per mathematical preliminaries. Um, there are often multiple ways of doing things. Um, I'd like to be precise about how we're doing that. And we always need to be aware of the underlying assumptions, if there are any. And this is one very simple case. Now, I'd like to do the same thing by making use of a non-orthonormal basis set. So A dot B, the same operation. Sum over I, alpha I, V I, dotted with sum over J, beta J, V J, okay? And that's equal to sum over I, sum over J, alpha I, beta J, V I dot V J. Right. Um, and now in this setting, the result is emphatically not equal to alpha i beta i, or alpha k beta k sum. Why? Because this is not an orthonormal basis set. In other words, v i dot v j is not necessarily equal to zero if i is not equal to say, j. For instance, v1 dot v3 may not be 0, right? Non-orthonormal basis set, v1, v2. Their dot product is not 0. And hence, the corresponding term is not going to vanish. It's going to remain in the sum. So there is nothing I can simplify here. This is the result. So the result is not alpha i, beta i, sum over i, but the whole thing. Okay. So is not equal to delta ij. They could be orthonormal, orthogonal, right? They could be orthogonal, but they don't need to be normalized either. So all of those are, or they could be normalized, they don't have to be orthogonal. Normal, ortho, orthogonal. Right? So I am specifically referring to an orthonormal basis set whenever I write this. And from now on, right, um, from now on, I will assume, well, actually, one more example. I will always assume in this course that we do work with an orthonormal basis set. Why? Because certainly ways of expressing and calculating things are very straightforward in that setting. Otherwise, we can work, do all of continuum mechanics based on a non-orthonormal basis set. And often, it is required, it's absolutely necessary in certain cases. Uh, but in this, in, this, in this course, I will be able to do away with that complication and uh, use this simple setting. Um, all right, so one more example to the complications that could possibly arise from a non-orthonormal basis set. 
And that is simply calculating the coefficient that belongs to a vector along a basis set. For instance, you give me the vector a. I know what the vector is. And you tell me what the basis vectors are, v1, v2, or for that matter, e1, e2, etc. And I'm asking you a very simple question. Well, what is the value of a along v1? What is alpha 1? Or what is a1? Can you tell me that quantity? So you have to calculate it, right? So I'd like you to calculate um, AI, which would be, for instance, the projection or component. Either one is a good enough term. Projection or component of A along a basis set member. In this case, I'm writing AI, so you immediately understand that I'm referring to the orthonormal basis set EI. Um, now, I think you would all agree that this is how I would calculate it. Okay? Um, so if you don't remember that, let's work it out. So I'm going to calculate A dot EI. Okay? So I always do what I do. Well, I, I will keep doing this again and again. So whenever I have some operation that I'm not quite sure of, I will go ahead and uh, substitute the expression of A. The expression for A is A E, um, now I is already appearing here. This is something you often have to be careful about. I shouldn't use I here anymore. Let's use something else, J, sum over J. Okay? This is the expression of the vector with respect to this basis set, dot EI. And that's equal to sum over J, AJ, EJ, dot EI. So now at this stage, I'm keeping these operations explicit. Very soon I will fast forward, and whenever I see this, I will immediately write delta ij. But for now, I'm writing it and then indicating it. So that's delta ij. And there's a sum over j. And unless for the i that I have chosen, i is equal to j, the value of delta ij is 0. So in other words, after the sum, sum the only thing that will survive is only the component of a along i. So A dot EI indeed gives me AI. That's my expectation. OK. Um, so essentially, in the setting that we are um, accustomed to, if I have a, right, for instance, if this is E2 and that is E1, and this is my vector A, right? So you take a dot with e1, that would give you a1, and its dot with e2 would give you a2. That's what I'm doing in this operation. Okay? But if you have a non-orthonormal basis set, again, you have to be careful. So you can easily verify yourselves, but I'll do it on the board, that alpha i is not equal to a dot vi. Okay? So this is a natural expression that we are accustomed to. It's at the back of our minds from many years of undergrad math, usually. But if it's a non-orthonormal basis set, which one could wish to use? That's not the case. And the result is, so let's do the same thing again. What is the result? It's something we can easily derive, right? So a dot vi is now what I'd like to do. And now I am working with an, in a non-orthonormal basis set. So sum over j alpha j beta j dotted with, sorry, alpha j vj dotted with vi. And that is equal to sum over j um, alpha j vj dot vi. And this is not Kronecker delta. So the result is not equal to alpha j. I'm sorry, not equal to alpha i. It doesn't simplify. So it doesn't simplify. That's simply the result. You have to preserve the sum over j. That will give you the value of the component of a along vi.
Again, the point is that, well, the point is that we want to work in an orthonormal basis set because life will be much simpler for us, at least for the purposes of our, 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 um, our lecture. So we choose to work with EI. Okay? That's my choice. Okay? It's not necessary. It's just my choice. Um, now, of course, here's the question. Um, often, it is the case that, not for us, in the 3D Euclidean vector space, you can easily choose your three basis sets. But in general, it is not obvious how to, uh, it, is, it is not so hard to choose a basis set, but it's hard to ensure that it is orthonormal. Okay? You can choose any three vectors that are not linearly dependent. That's a basis set. But to ensure that they are orthonormal is not always easy if your space is a strange space. Then it turns out, however, you're lucky. Uh, there is a process that will deliver you a, con a convenient orthonormal basis set starting from an arbitrary basis set, and it's called Gram-Schmidt or orthogonalization. Let's say orthonormalization because we want to have an orthonormal basis. So that's just for your reference. So as soon as you can choose a, a linearly independent set of vectors, a basis set, you can always construct an orthonormal one from it. OK, questions so far? All right. So now that we have simplified our life a little bit, let us move on to, again, a matter of convenience. Okay? A convenience that is almost always followed. And it's called the summation convention. And sometimes it's also called the Einstein notation. It will simplify our lives greatly. Uh, and the idea is very simple. I'd like to compact my amount of writing on the board. For my purposes, that's what it serves. Um, but it's more than that, of course. It allows sort of ideas to come through more clearly. So I'd like to write down a dot b. And so far, what I'm writing is sum over i. In fact, it's already simplified. I should write sum over i equals 1 to the dimension of the space bi, etc. So what the Einstein notation or summation convention does is it does away with this explicit summation indication and simply writes that. And you are supposed to understand that this is equivalent to this. So this here is the transition. Um, now, of course, there should be certain rules so we don't misunderstand or misinterpret uh, some expression on the board. And the rules are the following. And there are only two rules. Um, the first rule is that if you have a repeated index, um, that index is sometimes called a dummy index, and I'll tell you why. They indicate summation. Any index that is not repeated are called, well, is called a free index. So we have a repeated or dummy index and a free index. If it's repeated, then it indicates summation. Otherwise, it's just an index. Um, the second rule is that no index may appear more than twice and indicate summation. <coughs> this is, again, to avoid any misunderstanding. So if I want to indicate a sum over an index that appears three times, 
I don't want to use the Einstein notation. Okay? So in other words, it goes implicit that repeated index means an index appearing, sorry, my fingers are bound to another, twice only. Okay? Okay? All right, so those are the rules. Simple rules, but please read them once again while I raise the other board because these rules are very, very often violated at the beginning stages. I'll immediately give you a few examples so that we understand how it works. Uh, but just read over, please. OK, so let us write down a few examples. So for instance, I'll do one for you. Um, I have a quantity with two indices. Of course, you understand now these to be the components of a matrix. Um, let's keep it that way for now. So A11 alpha 1, A12 alpha 2 plus A13 alpha 3. So um, what the Einstein notation allows us to do is write that more compactly. right? Um, traditionally, the way I would write that is sum over, let's say, i equals 1 to 3 a i, a 1 i, alpha i. This is how I would normally write it, right? But now, because I have the Einstein notation, what I can do is I can simply write sum a 1 i alpha i, okay? Why is it equivalent? Because I look at that expression and I see an index that is repeated twice and I understand that there is a summation over that index. And we also implicitly understand that that sum goes over the dimension. So in this case, one to three, all right? Um, now, the other point is that i is called a dummy index, okay, repeated index. And the reason is that it really doesn't matter whether I have here i or let's say k or j or if you like p, it really doesn't matter because it serves to only indicate that it stands for a1, 1, 1, and plus 2, 2, plus 3, 3, etc. It just indicates summation, okay? Just as it does here. Um, now, another example, a11, b11, plus a12, b21, plus A13, b31. So how would I, how would I express that in summation convention? A1, I, B, I1, right? That would work. Okay. Um, or for that matter, J, J, K, K. Doesn't matter. All right. Um, now, here's a case where it's uh, quite nice and compact. Now, I have two matrices. A and B. And I multiply them and I get a new mat matrix C. And I'm interested in a component of C in terms of A and B. I'm not interested in any particular component. It could be any one of the components. So I'm going to put here, choose some indices to indicate that. Now, the indices are now important because they are not repeated. I, J. I could have chosen perhaps M, N, whatever. The point is that these are not repeated, so there is no summation over them. So what that means is I'm interested in, let's say, index C, component C, 1, 3, or 4, 5, or 3, 7. 
So whenever the indices are not repeating, implicitly they do refer to some value, but a value that you arbitrarily choose. But that value eventually is attached to those indices. So it's important to preserve them as they are. Okay, so now it's i and j, and I'd like to express them in terms of a and b. And there is a very compact expression for that, actually. Um, so why don't you take a few minutes and see if you can uh, find that expression in terms of the summation convention. Okay, so if you've thought about it at least for four minutes or so, uh, let, me, let me express the result for you and you can verify it yourself. So now, whenever you try to express something in terms of this um, summation convention, there will be usually a number of complicated, well, in general, number series of operations that lead to that expression. So you have to be careful. And there are a few rules that you can develop over time uh, to make sure that what you're doing is at least meaningful. I don't know if it's correct, but at least you can check whether the result is meaningful at all. And I will mention these conventions that, or um, ideas or checks, right, uh, as I write down examples, right? For instance, in this case, on the left-hand side, there are two indices. Both of these are free indices, okay? So they're not repeated. So you better make sure that those indices appear eventually on the right-hand side. If they don't, you miss something on the way. So i and j should appear on the right-hand side, okay? So presently, that's all you can do. And moreover, when they appear, i and j are appearing only once. On the right-hand side, you better don't have any i or j being repeated. Because if they're repeated, they are really dummy indices. It could have been k, it could have been m. So if you see two i's here, it's not really an i. It's a wrong expression because it's a dummy index. Okay? So um, the result in this case would be, you can check. Now I have an i and a j. It would be this. Okay? Um, now what would be wrong expressions. Let me write a number of wrong expressions. So, for instance, uh, n now, for instance, right, uh, let me, numerically wrong result would be this. It's numerically wrong, okay? So you can verify that this is correct and this is not, okay? Eventually, this is, in fact, not A multiplying B, but A transpose multiplying B would be indicated like this. So it means something else, right? Uh, but by checking the indices, I don't know if they are correct, if this is correct or not, but at least I know that it makes sense. There is an I and a J there, an I and a J there, and I and J appear only once, and there is a repeated index that appear, that, that is uh, dummy, right? And now here's another check. If you see a K, you, I put a K on the right-hand side for similar reasons. This should better not appear on the right, left-hand side because then it would be a free index that is carried over to the right-hand side as a repeated one, okay? So now, this is wrong for numerical reasons, but here is one that is wrong for violating the rules of the summation convention, right? You want to indicate a sum over the inner indices, but you chose i to indicate that. But there was already an i there, right? So now there are three indices, and that is why you are not allowed to do this. If you have three indices appearing, all of a sudden you mess things up, the meaning is not clear. That is sort of one reason why you have this rule b there, okay? So this is wrong because, um, right? Um, i is appearing three times. What is not wrong, okay, let's write this in blue. What is not wrong is, this is not wrong, okay? Because m is a dummy index. It could be anything, it's just in the case notation. Also, what is not wrong is my choice of the indices to begin with. So I'd like you to, that's verbally I tell you, now express any component of c in terms of a and b, and as I did that, I wrote Cij. I could have written C, M, N. And then I could have written, this is equal to A, M, I, B, I, N. This also is correct, okay? So you have plenty, well, some degree of freedom, 
but certainly some restrictions as well. If you obey the restrictions, the meaning should come through clearly. It's not so hard to make a mistake. So uh, in the first homework, I will assign you a number of examples that go through these exercises to sort of familiarize you and sort of warm up your hand to the use of this notation. Okay. Um, now, um, as I said, there are a number of things that are useful to remember. And just like the Kronecker delta, actually one that goes hand in hand with the Kronecker delta is a process that's called the substitution property. Um, it's something quite useful that now we can immediately make use of based on the summation convention. Now, often, what we'll, we will end up having is an expression that looks like this. So I'm just checking my indices. Sometimes I pick them cleverly to make the meaning come through clearly. In this case, it's not a big deal. I chose delta ij, ajk. Okay? Now, what you have to realize here is the meaning, right? So now i and k, they are free indices. So numerically, they have a value. Okay? So I cannot change them. I could have called them something else like M and L, but in any case, they have some value. J, on the other hand, it's a, it's a um, sorry, I and K are free. J is a dummy one. There is a summation over that. Um, so now I start summing. I and K has certain value, and J goes from 1 to whatever value it will take maximum. And along the way, it will pass through the value of I. Unless it is equal to I, it's equal to 0. So for all values of j that is not equal to i, this sum term will vanish. And the only thing that remains is j equals i. So what one thinks is, well, there is ij. I'm going to have i being carried over into the place of j. Because unless j is equal to i, that sum is equal to 0. And there is a sum due to summation convention. So the result is A i k. So what I've done in a sentence is there is a delta i j. And that goes, the repeated index is the repeated index of the Kronecker delta is replaced or substituted by the free index of Kronecker delta. So j is replaced by i, hence the name substitution property. Okay, that process is called the substitution property. Here's another example. I don't know why I wrote that in blue, in case. What's the result? Exactly, A, I, I, or A, J, J. Now, it's a bit tricky because both indices of I are repeated. You choose one of them, okay? So, I or J. I can choose I. I eliminate that and put J in place of I and then end up with J, J. Or what I could have done is I could have chosen J and I could have, what I could have done is I could have put I in place of J and end up with A, I, I. See, there is some degree of freedom, but the result should always be the same thing. In this case, it's just sum over the diagonal components of this matrix, A11 plus 2, 2 plus 3, 3, irrespective of how I denote the result. Okay, so that's called the substitution property. So, from now on, eventually, uh, we will make use of this quite often. And uh, whenever it pops up, I will just remind you at the beginning. And from then on, after a few uses, just make use of it implicitly. Okay. Um, all right. So we have only two minutes remaining. I think um, I will stop here today. Um, so next time, what we will do is we will go recall another uh, operation that has to do with vectors. In this case, in this lecture, we worked with the dot product. I will, so dot product of two vectors gives you a scalar. I will recall the operation of a vector or cross product. You take two vectors, you get a vector as a result. 
And to define that, I will introduce a, a symbol that is similar to the Kronecker delta that is going to be quite useful uh, in some concepts that we're going to cover. Okay, so I'll see you next time then.